Amen. Turn, if you would, to 101. 101. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate you. It's good to see some of our families enlarging a little bit during this time of year. Brother Abel, you've got some extra family with you, don't you? Amen. And so there's Cynthia, Cynthia back there with her mother. That's a special blessing also. It's good to have you guys. Sure is. Let's do this. Let's turn our Bibles uh, tonight to Matthew Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, and notice with me verse 25, Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much more than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit Unto his stature. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes, so clothe the grass of the field, which is to say, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Wherefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Father, we do recognize this block of scripture as very familiar scripture, yet at the same time, Lord, I, I just pray that we'll dig a little deeper and even see a little more of what, in fact, you want us to see, Lord. Yes, it really is true. We don't need to worry about tomorrow. We can even sing and write hymns about not worrying about tomorrow. But what does that really mean? Help us to see this in a biblical way. 
This doesn't mean that we're to be lazy. It doesn't mean that we're to be uh, not prepared for the future. Help us, Lord. Help us to see in a very clear way how this would apply to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Notice again, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Well, right there pretty much covers it. It seems like these are the things that are on our mind most of the time. Amen. Albert Einstein said, I never think of the future. It comes soon enough. Vince Havner, an evangelist of the past generation, said, Worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. Amen? And a preacher in Dublin, Ireland, R.C. Trent, had one of those phobias that, that I can't relate to, but I've got probably my share of phobias. He had a terrible fear of being paralyzed. I'll tell you what my, one of my fears is, is the idea of getting stuck in a tunnel or something like that. Anybody ever, anybody have any of those kinds of fears? Well, his fear of being paralyzed was, was, was paralyzing to him because it was something that was always on his mind. One evening at a party, he, uh, he was sitting next to a lady and and, and the lady heard him whispering to himself, it's happened at last. I, I've lost all feeling in my right leg. And then the lady responded, uh, Pastor, it might comfort you to know that it is my leg that you're pinching right now, not yours. So you better be careful about, you know, some of these things. Amen? Take no thought for tomorrow. We're not to worry about tomorrow. You know, we make light of these things, but the real truth is, in a lot of ways, it's worry that for some of us, we'd have to put up there as one of our biggest sins. I would say that Anita had some of the most remarkable grandparents anybody would ever want to meet. They loved the Lord, they served the Lord, walked with the Lord all their life. And I can remember when we first got married and I met them, they were such an inspiration and an encouragement to me. And if, and if there was anything that they probably would confess to being their biggest sin, I would probably have to say it was worry. Worrying about grandchildren and worrying about, you know, situations and circumstances. And, you know, sometimes we might think, well, that's okay, Right? Well, concern is right and proper. Recognizing an issue or a problem and doing something about it is one thing. But when you start to worry and you get to a place where you're worrying so much that you're making yourself sick over it, then we've stepped over into sin. And you know, the real truth is, this is an issue for all of us because we kind of give ourselves a free pass when it comes to this kind of a problem. And we don't maybe think that it's really that big of a problem in light of all the other sins that one might commit. But the real truth is, guess what? Worry can tear you down. Worry can tear your family down. Can tear churches down. Can tear ministries down. It's, it's putting yourself on the throne, isn't it? And saying to God... I can't trust you. I am, I am worried. I am thinking that things aren't going to go right. They're not going to get done. And we're obviously not demonstrating our trust in the Lord. Now, while I say that, all of us know that this is a battle. It's, there's no doubt about that. And sometimes we recognize that we need to check ourselves. And so, in this passage, there is a command a contrast, a comfort, and a calling. First of all, please notice with me, a command, a command. Verse 25 could also be said, don't worry about your life. 
Amen? Amen. Really, don't worry about your life. If, if God gave us life, surely he, he can be trusted with the little things in our life. Amen? Isn't it amazing how we'll trust him for salvation and then we won't trust him for something that's a lot less significant? If God gave us bodies, surely we can trust him to, to give us clothes. <laughs> you know, some of us, the Lord has probably given you plenty. I have seen some of the closets and I know what I'm talking about. I look at some of the, some of the clothes that uh, my own family has, including myself. And I'm thinking we are so uh, overly blessed, if you will. You know, we can, we can trust God. We know that he's not stingy or forgetful about our needs, and we don't need to worry. There are places in this world where you might find yourself in a third world country where actually just having something to wear is a major issue. And isn't it kind of insulting when we'll look in our closet and, it's, and we've got literally hundreds of dollars, even thousands of dollars. You know, a few suits now can cost you a thousand dollars worth of clothing and we say, I don't have anything to wear. While someone else is just hoping to be able to cover themselves. William Barclay, a British Bible expositor, said that we should use our past as a guide for better action in the future. The past should not be something that, that leads us to brood until we're, until we're worrying ourselves and into some emotional paralysis like the uh, pastor that I just mentioned. When it comes to Christ, he is the one who demonstrates for us what, what we're supposed to do. I mean, we have been forgiven. We have had our sins forgotten. And that means all of our sins, our past sins, present sins, and future sins. We can completely know that, that worry is totally useless. That if, if God can save our soul, he can sure take care of any little situation in our life. A French soldier in World War I carried with him this quote about worry. Of two things, one is certain. Either you are at the front or you are behind the lines. If you're at the front, of two things, one is certain. Either you will be exposed to danger or you are in a safe place. If you are exposed to danger, of two things, one is certain. Either you are wounded or you're not wounded. If you're not wounded, if you are wounded, of two things, one is certain. Either you will recover or you will die. If you recover, there is no need to worry. If you die, you can't worry. So why worry? Worry is useless. I guess that's the way to go to war, amen? Worry. Maybe for you, maybe for a loved one, maybe for someone whom your heart breaks for, worry is a major issue, a major problem. Worry wears out the body and the soul. Judgment, the ability to make decisions, the power to deal with life are, are hindered by worry. So, you know, we need to do our best as we, as we consider that the only, really, the only thing that the Lord asks is that we do our best. We can't do better than our best. And we need to trust the Lord. Amen. Secondly, quickly tonight, a contrast, a contrast. Christ strengthened his command, do not worry, by drawing three contrasts. First, he drew a contrast between men and birds. We've read this and reread this and heard this preached over and over. Birds do not worry about their lives. 
I have never seen a nervous bird laying on a psychiatrist's couch wondering about what's going to happen tomorrow. They do not try to hoard food for the future. The, uh, the lesson that Jesus was teaching is not that birds do not work. No other creature really works harder than birds, I'm telling you. If, if you're like me and you're a real nerd and you get into, for example, for me, it's bees. Just watching how busy and how, how they work and ants. When I was a kid, just sitting there looking at an, at an ant bed was totally fascinating to me. Even if the ants were stinging my little brother, I thought that was fascinating, you know. But they're, they're not lazy. They're all working just like the birds. But they're not stressed or worried. They're not preoccupied with what might happen. The lesson that, that we learn from birds is that they work hard, but they don't worry. You know how many of us have worried about things that have never even come to pass? You know, we made ourselves sick over something that never, that never even happened. The Lord was not saying that we should sit around like cage birds waiting to be fed. What he's saying is, is that we are to be birds of the air, if you will. We are to work hard and yet remain free from worry. Do your best, work hard, and trust the Lord. That's what the Lord is talking about. Christ drew a contrast between men and flowers. Now, only in the Bible will you find men associated with flowers. That's a good thing, amen? Flowers bloom one day and soon wither and die. We have, we have plants here that, that only bloom. I have something out in front of our house, and I'm not even sure what it is. Some of you who actually know these kinds of things can tell me. I think I've actually put it online before and said, what is this? I do know this, that whenever we do have a rain, flowers pop out for one day. And the bees come around, and they're, they're doing their thing, and then those flowers wither and die. They, it doesn't, you don't see them any other time. So any time of the year, it can happen. You know, all of nature, all of creation, God is teaching us to say, we don't have anything to worry about. God is holding the earth uh, in orbit, holding the earth exactly the right distance from the sun. If you think about it, if we were just a little bit closer to the sun, we'd all burn up and die. Sometimes it feels like that in the summertime. I appreciate it, especially if you've ever been to the Mojave Desert where I grew up. Or if the earth were just a little bit further away from the sun, well, it would feel like the winter Texans feel when they stay home and not come down here. Amen? It gets cold. It gets really cold. Well, the real truth is God is, is holding everything in place, and we don't need to worry. William Barclay said, if God gives such beauty to a short-lived flower, how much more will he care for man? And that flies in the face, of course, of a lot of folks who don't fully appreciate that man is more important than God's creation and all that is in it. The third contrast drawn by Christ is between men and pagans. He admonished us not to worry like the pagans do. Notice again, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. So, really basically he's saying, so don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathen, really? For they, they take pride in all these things and are deeply concerned about them. And we're not supposed to do that. That's pretty amazing because there are plenty of scriptures that point out that there's a certain way we are supposed to be as Christians. You know, if you've trusted in the Lord, if you're saved, you know, you're, you're recognizing that, that, uh, that you're saved to the uttermost. You don't, have to, you don't have to spend every day wondering 
if, if the Lord is mindful of your needs. You can understand how important it is to completely place your trust in him. And really, distrust is lack of faith. There's no doubt about it. We see thirdly, quickly, a comfort. Now that, that, now that we've heard the command and seen the contrast, there is a comfort. It's awfully comforting to know that God knows all our needs. He really does. He does. Even those needs which, which we're not even aware of. How amazing is it when we, in hindsight, see that God was out in front of whatever we didn't even see coming and met our need. Even before we ask what, what, our, what, our, uh, what we think are our needs, he's already meeting our needs. God is aware of every need that you have. Think about that. Even before you're aware it's that kind of trusting and believing that brings comfort in a God who, who knows your need. He is a personal, he is a all-powerful, and he is a all-knowing God. He understands us, and he cares for us. This is a God of comfort. We stand on the threshold of a dark unknown. A lot of us are, are wondering what lies ahead. You know, it seems like one year we hear that the economy's bad, the next year it seems to be better, and it seems like geopolitically you never know what's going to happen in the future. Well, the real truth is we don't need to know about tomorrow or what it holds because we know who holds tomorrow. Amen? And how important is that? And how wonderful is that wonderful hymn that we sing, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow, amen? You see, with Paul, we can say, I know whom I have believed. And then we see a calling, a calling. Jesus issued a calling which is fulfilled which, if fulfilled, will defeat worry. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know what? It just really is true. There is no doubt. I remember when I first got saved and I read that verse, I thought, well, that's great. I mean, I can have anything and everything that I want. How cool is that? And then I began to realize as I grew in my walk and relationship with the Lord, the things that I was seeking began to change. I became more in line with what his will was for me. And it really is true. We're not as concerned about the lost as we probably should be. Only when we're walking with the Lord are we more concerned about the lost. We're not as concerned about the needs of others as we probably should be. Only when we're in right relationship with the Lord does that matter more. We're not as concerned about the unlovely. We're not as, as concerned about the unfortunate unless we've gone through difficult times. And this is where the Lord helps us to understand. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, what things? These things that will matter more to your heart will be, will be added unto you. Now, that doesn't mean that the Lord won't bless you materially. If he does, give him praise and glory. You know, what's amazing, I've seen some people struggle more with, with having just a little bit than others who have, who have received much more because they've got... They're focused right. They know that the, it's, it's God who receives all the glory. Amen. I have seen people who, who have realized that, that the Lord has blessed them. Therefore, they're going to be a blessing to others. We kind of use this language today, you know, pass it forward. Well, we're, we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to completely trust the Lord. 
And you know, when I say this, it's real easy when everything's going okay, when we don't have any big decisions to make, when there are no foreseeable problems in the future. But maybe for somebody tonight, there might be. You might be really troubled. You might be thinking, this time of year when everybody's so happy about, you know, family and Christmas and all these kinds of things, I, I'm thinking about my job or, or a, a, a need that we have or, or our, uh, you know, somebody may be struggling with, with a physical problem or even a spiritual problem. Know this, it really is true. You have a God who is on the throne and in control. He loves you. Here's our job. We're to do this. Psalm 37, 5 says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And basically, he will do this. Well, let's look, let's look at it. I was going to just turn there real quick. Psalm uh, 37. Psalm 37, 5, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Can I just say, and look at verse 6, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Your, your peace is found in totally trusting him. If you're doing what you know you're supposed to be doing and you're placing your trust in him, you can now rest in that. The book of Hebrews is really all about rest for the Christian. That, that rest that comes with knowing that you're in God's will, that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you're fully trusting in Him. Amen? Amen. So, if you're worried about that Christmas shopping list that isn't, hasn't been fulfilled yet, don't fret it. Don't worry too much about it. If you received a gift from somebody this week that you did think you were going to get a gift from, and now you think you got to get them one, just don't worry about it. Amen? Give them a big smile and hug and tell them that you love them. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, let's do this. Let's get to praying. And when we pray, we like to break up into groups. If we get four or less, that's, that's a good-sized group. And uh, we can be uh, doing that in just a moment. But let me ask you, do you have any prayer requests? Any praise reports? Anybody? Yes. Cynthia.